Hello everyone and welcome back to my colonization series in Kerbal Space Program 1.1.3. In this episode I'm going to start off by testing a new system to deliver supplies to the moon or to Duna. And in this case we're going to be trying to deliver fertilizer. And we've got a thousand units of fertilizer here for our moon base. We are also carrying some uh, KAS tools, uh, in particular the electric screwdrivers and so that's on the box there. I tweak scaled this container so that it's only 50% of its total uh, of, of its usual size and I checked that the volume also resizes and it does. We have a reaction wheel. You'll note parachutes and that's because this vehicle that's going to bring the supplies is intended to come back to Kerbin or in the case of the Duna delivery uh, the parachutes will be used to uh, deliver the stuff to Duna and it won't be coming back. So for Duna it won't be returning, for or for Ike also it won't be returning. It's also designed so they can deal with Ike. Um, but for uh, the moon delivery or Minmus delivery it's supposed to come back. And that's why it has the heat shield. The heat shield is for oh, heat shield is for uh, Duna, of course uh, air braking around Duna and also if it returns to Kerbin after delivering supplies to the moon or Minmus. Its power, its engines, are the LV-1F Fire Ant, which are radial LV-1s. So they are uh, radial derivative of the ant engine, which I love. And of, of course this is the fuel here. Uh, you see that it has 986 meters per second right now, but after it delivers its supplies, it has 1,458. So it's going to use some of that fuel to make a soft landing and then it's going to use the rest of the fuel to come back in the case of the moon delivery which is what we're testing it out on this time. It's got solar panels and all. And you know if we wanted to slap on some instruments we could do that too but in this case uh, we have the pipe endpoints because it has to connect to the base. Ooh, I only have one. We need two. These are actually pretty heavy amazingly. You know, just two. So they take a little bit out of our delta V. But anyway, uh, so that's why we needed the drills, of course, is, uh, well, uh, because we need to pick up one of the pipe endpoints and put it on the base in order to connect the pipe up. Okay, uh, here we have one of the rear guard engines, and this is the transfer stage. Uh, well, it's a transfer stage if we were going to Duna. Uh, for the moon mission that we're going to do this time, it's actually the getting into orbit around the moon and first ascent stage. And then we use the little, a little bit of fuel from the lander itself to complete the descent. The next stage is an LV-900 Beagle. This is related to the Terrier. The Terrier is uh, slightly less powerful than the Beagle. The Beagle has more power and that was necessary because you can see even with the Beagle here the TWR is 0.77 so it's a little bit under power but by that time the rocket will have gotten us to a nice high altitude so the Beagle for the moon mission will complete orbit and also transfer us to the moon or Minmus uh, for the Duna mission it will actually be complete completing orbit and then this engine will send us over to Duna and that's because for the Duna mission, we won't have the two boosters. For the moon mission, if we're trying to recover this lander, we need the boosters. Because again, of course, uh, the moon does not have an atmosphere that will help us slow down. Okay, and then of course, the boosters are recoverable. And the core here with the skipper engine at the bottom is recoverable. These are LVT-30s. Okay, so it's an interesting little system. Highly dependent on stage recovery and the one curious thing is the way this keeps happening it keeps wanting to go away from that uh, that fairing base not too sure why that is okay so I've named it the Argos system continuing with the pattern of naming things after Greek cities and I'm gonna save and yeah I think uh, we can just go ahead and see if this works out or if I've forgotten anything okay here we go SAS on throttle is up 
and yeah, everything looks to be in order. Here we go. Now this is relying on the skipper engine to hold it steady, so maybe this doesn't work out. Um, for well, that's not an error that I was expecting. Uh, we have a random unplanned disassembly, folks. Yeah. Actually, oh, uh, oh, I shouldn't have done that at all. Uh, we've got parachutes, right? Uh, but they didn't deflate in time. I bet if I had moved away from render range, it would have worked out. But what the heck happened? Structural failure on linkage between conic fairing and interstage fairing adapter. Structural failure between... It's the interstage fairing adapter. Conic fairing. Structural failure on linkage between fairing base and procedural stack decoupler. It's that one place where it got separated, right? Let's let's take it to the VAB and see what's going on. Cause, yeah, I mean we've got crippled joint reinforcement now. It could be, but the this isn't the conic fairing that's set at the top. This is this is a egg shaped fairing. The conic fairing is this one. This is the only conic fairing here, and it said interstage uh, adapter, so it'll be this one. That somehow fell apart. But yeah, we've got we've got crumbled joint reinforcement. It's not supposed to fall apart like that on us. But okay. Um let's just try some struts, I suppose. Three struts. It seemed to occur at the top though, so let's put some struts up here. And it said between the fairing base and this decoupler. Which is weird. I mean, that sure looks like a pretty firm link to me. But, it does have that issue where this decoupler tends to float above the fairing base all the time. Maybe I should put fins on. We'll see whether the gimbling... I mean, I always try and see whether the gimbling on the skipper or any other main engine is enough to handle the rocket, and I'm always disappointed, right? It won't be too big a deal to add fins. We we're trying to recover that part. After all, we are going to recover the fins. SAS on. Barrel up. Here we go. I did there it didn't work here yeah, let me try and go to a part that's really far away I don't know if I can get far enough away from it for stage recovery to work out now I probably can't get too clump well if this piece flies out of render range of everything no I don't think so yeah it's sort of a vain hope what is this oh the, the lander section Okay. Hmm. Um. Structural failure on linkage between conic fairing and interstage fairing adapter. Let's try going a bit slower. Maybe? Maybe it's too heavily stressed. Yeah, okay. Let's revert to launch this time and see if that's a thing. If it doesn't work this time, I'll take the loss and I'll reevaluate. Okay. Let's go partial power. That's a nice calm lift off pace. Well, this time we're probably going to have a flip. Ah, uh, I 
overdid things. Okay. Mm. I'm uh, not sure what all that's about. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try and get as far away from those pieces as possible so stage recovery uh, handles them. Okay. Oh, well, the probe has parachutes. Okay, hold on. By the way, these, these other stages were not very important. They, they aren't very expensive. I don't think we got far enough away from the other stages for stage recovery to handle them, though. This was the most... well, I think the launch stage is probably the most expensive part. This is pretty expensive, though. I guess we tested one part of the system. So what happened this time? Still, structural failure on linkage between conic fairing and interstage fairing adapter. And then other things happened, but that was the main error. So I'll take the loss on this one. Uh, well, whatever loss I had, we'll recover this. Ooh. It really sank. Okay, let me recover. Okay, well. Got 10,000 funds back. What's this piece? Nothing important. Okay, well, let's let's go to the R and D center and spend some of the science, shall we? Let's let's do that. Okay, um, actuators. In fact, I was looking for robotic parts. I think that might help instead of having the little fire ants tilted like that, which is less efficient. We could have an extendable arm with them on. Uh, so that they can be retracted and fit under the heat shield, but then extend to get clearance away from the heat shield. Yeah, I think I'll research this. Extendable RCS booms I like. Oh, I've always liked those. And of course, large reaction wheels. Okay, let's get that. I think then we have to focus on the science -y stuff. Fuel cells, solar arrays... Planetary greenhouse, now that's something. We definitely need to examine this K and K planetary greenhouse. And this has other scanners. I think I like the other scanners. Okay, I'm gonna research that. And it's called science tech, you can't can't go wrong with that. Yeah, I think I'll go with the solar panels, radiators, and then we can build some serious stations. Take a look at the planetary alignments. I think we're going to be focused on the moon and Minmus as a priority because none of the planets are really in a good position. And before we do anything else, we'll have to supply the Pioneer base anyway. They've only got 20 days of supplies and 72 days of habitation. We could bring them back, but they should test out that greenhouse that they already have on there. Okay, well, now for something completely different. The Hornet. The Hornet is a lander for the surface of the moon, and it has many interesting features. It's only going to carry 200 units of fertilizer, as you can see down here, uh, but it uses this engine for the first time. This is the Shiba rocket motor, which is a, a atomic rocket motor, and it is, uh, it's not that great. It's got 10 kilonewtons, and its ISP is 515, but it's small and it's light. So that's an interesting proposition. And we'll see how it works out. 515 isn't great compared to the Nerve. And the Nerve has 800. But, you know, uh, this has this form factor and we don't have to carry 2.5 tons or 2.25 tons with us. In fact, 2.25 tons, the mass of the Nerve, would almost equal the weight of the entire Hornet. Um, you can see that it has two landing engines, rear guard engines. They gimbal five degrees, and I've made sure that the center of thrust is in line with the center of mass. The center of mass, as you can probably tell, 
is right here. And we have a docking port for controlling during landing and also for refueling this because it is not that expensive. It's 13,000, but we would like to reuse it. And so the deal is that this is going to land on the moon. Uh, we're going to uh, transfer the fertilizer and then it's going to reach orbit again. And then we'll have another mission dock up with it, uh, resupply it with the liquid. This is the liquid fuel tank for the Sheba. And then uh, we have liquid fuel and oxidizer in these two tanks for the rear guards. And so those will be refueled and then uh, we'll add some more fertilizer and then it'll bring it back down. We've got the KIS container so that we can have the connector ports and the screwdrivers. So that's in there. There's a remote controller so we don't have to bring a Kerbal down but just in case we can send a Kerbal down in this. Uh, it doesn't have any food, water and oxygen though. So I'm wondering about this AI AES pod how the Kerbal was supposed to survive in it when there doesn't seem to be any resources. I guess it'll be alright for a very limited amount of time using the EVA suit resources and so maybe uh, a couple of hours, just enough time for a Kerbal to transfer into this and land and then uh, for this to take off, I mean just that much. So uh, one Kerbal transfer to the base is basically what this is for. So we'll have another vehicle transfer the Kerbal to lunar orbit and then the curl will transfer into this to get down to the surface kind of thing. We'll have to see if that's a reasonable thing. Uh, you'll notice the RCS thrusters. Um, the RCS thrusters are these uh, AES RCS blocks and I chose them because the thruster power is low and of course it's fairly lightweight for having all of those blocks. So we'll see how those work as well. The, the mod propellant is in these containers and I think that's about it. Yep, so it should be interesting. 2.4 uh, tons. I don't know if in this pod the Kerbal has mass. It could be like the command seat. Uh, though, if we go in here, it does have the crew slot and we're going to remove Jeb because we're going to use the probe core for this one. And uh, yeah, okay. So now last time with the previous rocket, we had problems with the inner stage. Uh, I suspect, I don't know, that maybe that has to do with the engine I was using. I was using this Beagle engine, but I'm not sure. Uh, we have successfully used Interstages and the LV-909 before, so I'm using the LV-909 here, and I'm not using anything else. There's no fancy thing going on here. We've got parachutes. I haven't even put a controller on the lower stage. Uh, we're trying to recover it, but I don't know if we need a controller on it for stage recovery to be happy with it or not. The lower stage has four thud engines, and you can see they're arrayed as is, and that's so that we can have both a lot of thrust as well as gimbling, right? If we use the swivel engine, we got some gimbal, but 200 kilonewtons of thrust, uh, 270, 320, right? But we really are interested in sea level, and the thud has better sea level thrust than the swivel. Let's say two swivels, right? That's 2,400 cost, 400 kilonewtons. Well, the three thuds, I mean, not three thuds, four thuds. Three thuds would be equivalent to two swivels in, in cost. Four thuds is a little bit more, it's 800 more. Uh, but it provides 80 kilonewtons more than two swivels and has a better sea level ISP and also it has 8 degrees of gimbling. Now, is 8 degrees of gimbling enough to keep this from flipping? I don't know. What's the center of lift and center of uh, mass? Eh, horrible as usual. Okay, well, I I'll relent. I'll put fins this time. I really wish to give... I mean, of, of course, in real life, such a rocket would not have a problem, right? I mean, you've seen rockets like this without fins, hopefully and uh, they do rely on the engine gumbling. I keep pounding on this. I keep wanting this to work uh, without fins. Um, a finned rocket is fairly rare and only when the engines uh, don't gimbal much. Oh, I'll try it one time. Um, hopefully, I mean, the main consideration is that issue that we had with the fairings. We'll see. Okay, so we'll try this out. Okay, here we are, SAS on, throttle is up, and here we go.
I'm deliberately turning a little bit slowly. It's proving very wiggly. I'm going to manually control it. I don't think Smart ASS is handling the gimbling very well. Ah, uh, nor am I. Nor am I. Yeah, okay, forget it. I don't know. Just, just can't. Well, I mean, it was deviating a lot already. Yeah. Well, the, uh, it's interesting how the payload was sort of hanging out there. Hmm. Technically, the main stage, this is why I didn't have it crewed, by the way, it has parachutes, but it's all torn apart already. Even the parachutes are sort of like individual. Um, you know, there's a chance. Uh, uh, let, let's control from the right direction. The rear guard engines have a lot of thrust, you see. And I'll even put RCS on just to stabilize it. Uh, but not enough thrust. We're not slowing down. Uh, well, landing gear down. It's not really putting the landing gear down. Yeah, it's not slowing down enough. Ah. Okay. No, no, no revert. Let's just try this again. That was my fault. We'll put fins on. I think this would uh, cause even more problem for Smart ESS, so I'll just control it. Okay, here we are. Coral up, and off we go. Whoa, whoa. Start DVing all on its own. I think pieces from our, our other rocket are just now getting getting to the ground, I don't know. Um, it's very wobbly right now. SAS is producing a bit of a shimmy in the roll department. Probably the G-forces, though we're not that high on the Gs, so I don't know why. It too does not like the control surfaces, apparently. Okay, set. And ignition. Okay, LV-9 is good. We didn't have the same problem. Fairing release. Okay. All is well, even though it's still a bit shaky on the way up. Okay, we'll coast to Apoapsis here. So apparently toggling the gear doesn't actually toggle these landing gear? That's weird. It says deploying. I think it's the same thing as before where I have to come back and then it'll be doing the right thing. I don't know. We'll have to go to the Space Center and come back and maybe then they'll be deployed. I think that's the deal. Alright, we're in a tight orbit, but I really want to check whether I can get the landing gear down. So let me go back to the Space Center. And now the landing gear has extended, so that's good, but that's one heck of an annoying bug, I have to say. Alright. Plotting for the moon. Okay, we have our plotted transfer. 850 meters per second only. We've got plenty. This stage is supposed to take us there and then get us into orbit around the moon. And we have plenty to spare for that. Okay. Well, I'm just gonna wait till better burn time tells me when to do this. And I'll probably miss, because the bigger dots tend to go away faster than the smaller dots. 
Let's see, it's taking some time for... Let's see, it starts speeding up and then I always miss it. I'm gonna lock this fuel and this fuel for the landing. And that's because I don't want to imbalance it. The Shiba engine uh, takes from the furthest tank, which is this one, then it'll be imbalanced, right? Uh, we want the same amount of fuel in this tank and this tank. Oops, it went too far. Okay, that's a fine moon periapsis. Let's head over there. Maybe make this look good. Turn the right way, prograde. Venturing forth in the Hornet. Now the question is whether the fertilizer is going to help our life support situation. It's meant to allow the greenhouse to produce supplies. Okay, we are in Mooner SOI. Uh, we actually have to make sure that we can land at the right location. We don't have enough inclination right now. I guess I'll set Moonliner 1 as target for now. Though relative inclination is not right at all. Um, so a tilt like this. This should do the trick. Okay, nice tight orbit around the moon, but we have to wait a bit. Okay, well the base is not quite in daylight, but this is about right. Now, I want this to be as legitimate a test as possible, so we don't want to use all 214 meters per second from this stage. We just want to use enough so that this stage crashes into the moon and is disposed of. So let me get to Apoapsis. I'll bring the periapsis down, make sure it's crashing. And that'll be the minimal use of this stage to dispose of it. Okay, there we go. Assuming that uh, the terrain is not less than zero meters, which it shouldn't be. Okay, we want surface info. Gonna separate. And now we're gonna start off using the Shiba engine to slow down. And then only for the final touchdown phase will we use the rear guard engines. I wonder if you have lights. Eh, tiny little lights, headlights. Um, Pioneer base, yeah, that's the one we want. But No, there we go. Okay, good. I suppose we'll use landing guidance for a look at the situation. Whoa. Landing predictions are a bit iffy, probably because our periapsis isn't very definitive. Well, actually it's jumping back and forth between two very, very, very different scenarios. Uh, will a little burst of engine power fix this? Not that. These. Okay. Seriously throaty sounds. No, it's still... Still very dualistic. Um, okay, now it's resolved into something. TWR of the Sheba is not great. It's only a 10 kilonewton thrust engine. I think I should switch to the rear guards now. Of course, that means unlocking these, locking the Shiba fuel, and controlling from here, which is very, very different. Trying to make sure we're getting close here. That's better. Don't want to land on top of it either. Okay, I believe we are on the surface. Right. 20 meters. Is that close enough? I think 25 meters is close enough, but we'll have to see. So now we need a Kerbal to 
pop on out and grab the connector units, connect it up, and then transfer the supplies. And that Kerbal, that Kerbal, will be Georgie. Oh, can't exit module has no hatch. Ah. Okay, Georgie, transfer from the agricultural module to the pioneer module. Actually, right now the pioneer module wouldn't have a hatch either, so cancel that. Uh, transfer to the inflatable workshop. Yeah, we don't have fertilizer in the agricultural module right now. Okay. So now... Georgie, EVA. Very good. Over to the Hornet. The Hornet should retract its solar panels temporarily during this procedure. We got a lot of vehicles here. Yeah. Oh, and debris. And that, and that, and that. Oh, I think uh, we're actually far away from where we need to be. Shoot. Let's just switch to Georgie. I'll just have Georgie do the solar panels. Reason being, I don't want him to knock into them. while accessing the KIS container. Inventory and uh, inventory. Drill, equip, connector port. Um, anywhere will really do. We're gonna have to take it off before this takes off because the connector port actually throws off the center of mass a bit. And that into there. Close, close. Okay. Closest point on the base. That's quite a hobble he's got there, actually. Uh, too far? Possibly. It can't surface attach to this part? Oh, uh, it might not be able to surface attach to the inflatables, is that right? That is annoying. Oh, shoot. Oh, the collider on the base is also a little bit weird. That's fun. Let's see. Well, it doesn't seem to indicate a problem with colliding with the inflatable storage unit. Yeah, looks like the link works. We're not going to keep the link for very long. Okay, we'll keep Georgie out here for now on the EVA and transfer the resources. Fertilizer out. Uh, does he have to unlink it? I, I think... I think it can unlink itself. Let's see. No, not unplugged then. Okay, back to Georgie. Unlink. Crab. No, that's not the right way to do that. G. Grab, hold, and drop. Okay, good. Because, again, we don't want the center of mass to be thrown off by that one port. Alright, Georgie. Your job is now done. We need to get you back into the greenhouse to see if you can produce some supplies. This way. We have plenty of room for supplies. Well, uh, it seems like a load of fertilizer has disappeared here. Vessel productivity is negative. I'm not too sure how to read that. Where is that one? Efficiency is 25%. So let's start life support. 
I don't know. Is it producing stuff? Well, our uh, supplies are going up. So I suppose it is. Also, the solar panels on that might help with the charge here. Well, efficiency is 27% now. Guess better efficiency is good. Productivity is not as negative as it was before. Okay, we'll have them work together on that. Yeah, we definitely need uh, another solar panel module attached to this. Maybe we can send one like that and uh, hook it up. Maybe uh, place it here somewhere if we could land properly. Right now, the electric charge is going down. It's uh, not full daylight, obviously. We can't even see the sun. Maybe it'll be all right. Okay, but I want to test whether we can bring the Hornet back up again. It is now... Oh, actually the 33 is still in here. Uh-oh. I was hasty in uh, in disconnecting, I guess. It's weird. Okay, pick a transfer amount. Transfer. I don't get it. I don't get it. Uh, this is... Uh, if I pick a transfer amount, say... Three units. Transfer. Seems more than three units, isn't it? <sighs> yeah. It seems like there's a minimum amount of units. And it's not showing, it's not actually showing all the resources up there, so it's a little bit buggy right now. In a number of ways. But, nevertheless. I am going to try and bring this back to orbit because I wanted to test that. We'll have the solar panels back out. At least those extend without me going back to the Space Center. And up we go. But we don't want to overuse these engines. So now I'm going to switch engines. Going to lock these fuels. Unlock this one. Point in the direction I. Oh, let's control from here now. Point in the direction I want to go in. And then we go with the Shiba engine. Okay, looking good. And for now, the system works for what it's supposed to do. And we could probably put some extra stuff in that inventory can. It looks like we have some margin to work with. It's got uh, some extra fuel for rendezvous, I'm sure. I mean, the Delta V you see here is just for the Sheba. Then we still have remaining Delta V locked right now for the rear guards. All right, there we have it. The Hornet is in orbit, and with some margin to spare, and all of its mod propellant too. Don't forget that. Okay, so successful sort of system. Let's go back to the VAB and check out how much fertilizer, how how long 166 units of fertilizer, which we actually delivered there, will actually last. Incidentally, uh, we would like to check on our messages. Uh, started constructing first outposts on the moon from the a docking maneuver on the moon. Oh, the connecting the bases, uh, I mean connecting the Hornet to the base kind of as a docking maneuver. I see. Uh, but I wanted to know if we recovered the thud stage and we did. So that's good. A 2.1% recovered. Alright, so now the question is Taking a look at the base, that's the life support recycler, resource converter, mulch. I think we have mulch there, I hope. Fertilizer, 0.9 per hour. Uh, outputs 8.1 units of supplies per hour. I think they take 8.1 per day is the rate at which they consume. We can't check here. 
but I believe that's the case. So for let's just call it every one unit of fertilizer, uh, it can make. Uh, well, we'll just go by. So one fertilizer is a day's worth of supplies, uh, but 7.2 per hour of mulch. Let me check on. Now the mulch is they they produce mulch too. That's that's their poo. Um, how much poo do they produce? I don't know. And machinery 0.22 per day. I don't know if it actually consumes the machinery. I mean, it requires 200 and it's got 200. Three per second, though, is a huge electric charge consumption rate. Okay, well, we have 399 machinery, so it's been consuming some of it. And mulch it's also been consuming, but we've, we've got a lot of mulch. But basically, we need eight times as much mulch as fertilizer, but they produce some of the mulch. Interesting. We're gaining roughly two to three seconds of supplies per second. And they do require 8.1 supplies per day. Well, uh, as long as this lasts, that's fine. We've got enough fertilizer. It, it Let's just say it consumes one per hour. Uh, so, let me get out my calculator to see how quickly it is going to diminish. It's just 166 hours. So, in about seven days, we'll have run out of fertilizer here. But it will have produced uh, enough supplies for both kerbals for 80 days. Uh, wait, wait, I'm not thinking about days, right? I'm thinking 24 hour days, sorry. Um, four times that. So in 28 days, we'll run out of fertilizer. And in that time, it will have produced enough supplies for. Uh, still, uh, yeah, the days are. Okay, so it's, it's 6 to 1 then, not 24 to 1. Okay. Uh, gotta remember Kerbin days. So, uh, yeah. So 28 days will run our fertilizer and then it will have produced enough supplies for 80 days for these two. Right. I think that's correct. Alright, so that's our situation in our base right now. I think uh, after the initial failure, I had to build that system and then I had to build the replacement, the Hornet system. And I think at least I can be satisfied with how the Hornet turned out. I'll wrap it up here and I will proceed to work on something completely different for the next episode. Alright, so thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did enjoy this episode, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.